distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we resume our program with captivating OPIC dialogue that I'm sure is interesting to all of us. Please join me in welcoming His Excellency Mohammed Sinusi Bar Kindu, General Secretary of OPIC. Dr. Jason Bardoff, Professor of Professional Practice in International and Public Affairs and Founding Director, Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University. The session moderator. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for being here. We have a short session, I'm told, just uh, 10 or 15 minutes with His Excellency, the Secretary General of OPEC, but it's a pleasure and honor to be here with my friend, His Excellency Barkindo. So let me, um, let, me, uh, let me start where Hadley Gamble started with the prior panel, uh, Your Excellency, and ask you how you view the OPEC plus cuts, how they're going, uh, you know, how you view the state of the market looking into 2020. Are Iraq and Nigeria doing what is expected uh, of them? And what do you expect of Russia after the first quarter when people look toward March and toward June? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I hope you will allow me to, first of all, join uh, the speakers this morning in really congratulating the Aramco family and the IPTC 2020 uh, for such an outstanding uh, outing. This is my first time of attending IPTC, and I think I cannot choose a better time uh, than, than this one. I just uh, took part in the exhibition uh, rounds. It's highly impressive, uh, high quality companies uh, that have turned up and meeting uh, high quality, excellent delegates to this conference. Nearly 40,000 I had. So I, we in OPEC, we doff our heart uh, to uh, the organizers, uh, to the patron, uh, Prince Mohammed, as well as the Minister of Energy, Prince Abdulaziz, uh, uh, bin Salman. Uh, I think our member countries should emulate uh, the excellent performance of the kingdom in blazing the trail uh, in our industry. Uh, I want to also, before uh, proceeding, uh, to tell you that I have recovered fully. And uh, my Aramco doctors who <laughs> looked at me last night assured me it's not uh, infectious. <laughs> so you are safe where you are. Um, we're pleased you're feeling better. Uh, uh, I'm really glad to, to be in the kingdom, my second home. I was counting with my colleague, uh, Nadia Gura, this morning how many times I've been to this kingdom. Uh, I think we couldn't come to a conclusive number, but I, I recall that uh, it was 43 years ago when I first uh, accompanied my parents to this kingdom. And I think almost every year in the last 43 years, I took any slightest opportunity to come back to this uh, beautiful country, beautiful people, to my second home. So I'm glad to be here, even with my flu. <laughs> I'm glad you're feeling better. So I was told to ask you difficult, challenging questions. So you're gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna push you. So, so you're gonna tell us OPEC's price target, correct? Well, okay, you don't have to answer I, that. I, I had you uh, plotting with uh, Amin Nasser that uh, <laughs> You should uh, have no mercy on me, despite my flu, to ask me the most difficult questions. Well, so start but, by talking uh, about how you view. The, I, I thought the I mean was my friend, <laughs> you too. Uh, but in, in any event, I think time is of the essence. Uh, the uh, the current state of affairs within the OPEC plus, as we have come to be called by the media and even by the practitioners themselves, I think so far so good. Uh, in the last three years. We managed to work together. We managed to take decisions together, implement them together, and even for the first time in history, uh, monitor the implementation of our decisions uh, through the Ministerial Monitoring Committee comprising both OPEC and non-OPEC. Now, moving into 2020, as you have heard from Prince Abdulaziz uh, this morning, uh, we remain focused on ensuring that uh, 
uh, we do not relapse uh, to where we were a few years ago. Uh, the imbalance that we saw in the market uh, over the past few years that had set prices uh, crashing by nearly 80% at some time uh, was due largely to the inability of OPEC and other producers at that time uh, to rise to the challenge. We had no framework, we had no mechanism, uh, and our biggest de facto biggest producer, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, made it very clear that they could no longer shoulder the responsibility of balancing the market. Uh, they needed everybody to be on board. And I think that had worked. Uh, the industry and the producer responded, and hence the declaration of cooperation, which they continue to lead in the implementation. Even in our meeting in December, uh, it was made very clear that uh, all participating countries should continue to play their role, big or small, uh, not to continue to rely on the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia uh, to carry the can alone. So when we look toward the March meeting uh, and that, as you said, the call for 100% compliance, we've moved closer in that direction, but I think based on the secondary sources, we're not all the way there yet. So what does that mean for the ability in March to come together and agree to extend the agreement or maybe even deepen the cuts? If you look at the uh, record of compliance or conformity, as the lawyers would like to call, uh, from January 2017 to date, it's been remarkable. Uh, collectively, we continue to do over 100%. But when you dig further, you would see that uh, countries like Kingdom of Saudi Arabia continue to voluntarily uh, go over and above what they are required to ensure that we remain focused in our objective of maintaining this balance on a sustainable basis. Uh, what Prince Abdulaziz uh, made very clear in December in Vienna was to call on all other producers in the Declaration of Cooperation to ensure that they attain their 100%. Uh, with that, it will strengthen his hands in doing more than what is required, if needs be, if the market <coughs> requires that. And Iraq and Nigeria have a little more work to do, is that right? I think they are coming along, both Iraq and Nigeria are coming along. The preliminary numbers uh, we saw a couple of days ago, we are still waiting for, from, from uh, other sources. Uh, I think uh, they have given their words in December uh, to the Prince and to the conference, and we remained uh, confident that they would be able to achieve 100%. And what, what's OPEC's view when you look at the balances for 2020 is additional, uh, aside from the possibility of some supply disruption and geopolitical risk, uh, you see oversupply in 2020 and the need for possibly additional measures by way of cuts? Our projections based on these six second resources that we follow in December, which we presented to the Conference of Ministers, uh, showed a possible potential imbalance in the first and the second quarter. And I think there is uh, unanimity among all the sources. The numbers differ. Uh, but the decision led by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia uh, to go beyond the 1.2 million barrels a day adjustment that we took in July uh, last year with additional 500 thousand, bringing the total to 1.7 uh, and factoring in their voluntary over compliance of 400,000 to 2.1 million barrels a day would be able to uh, maintain balance in the first and the second quarter. The third and fourth quarters of the year uh, look relatively okay in terms of demand growth, um, for, for example and therefore there is no cause for concern at the moment. And when you, I, I think from the outside, market watchers look at, uh, have a perception that perhaps what the kingdom and other Gulf countries are looking for in terms of market conditions perhaps is not exactly the same as how Russia thinks about what it would like to see in the oil market. Talk about the OPEC, OPEC uh, non-OPEC compliance, the charter agreement, and what's the state of cooperation now? Uh, the Charter of Cooperation is a step forward from the Declaration of Cooperation. Uh, 
we have been consulting among ourselves on how to institutionalize this partnership that has so far worked in the last three years, and hence the signing of the Charter of Cooperation by all the 24 participants in the DOC, and even inviting other producers in the world who may uh, wish to join. And uh, the Russian Federation, uh, together with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, continue to provide that leadership uh, in ensuring that this group remains together, uh, continues to work together uh, in the best interest of all producers and all consumers, and by extension, the global economy. You have heard from the IOCs this morning in your panel uh, testifying uh, to the fact that what we are doing together with our partners uh, in the OPEC plus is also good for them. And, and o OPEC always has to be, there's always uncertainty in thinking about the oil market, but it does strike me that there is a need now to be even more nimble and flexible because of potential fundamentals that might require even uh, deeper cuts, but at the same time, so much uncertainty in terms of the state of geopolitics in the region, the possibility of supply disruptions, the possibility of policy changes, like something that could either under a Republican or Democrat administration, some deal that could lead to Iranian barrels coming back into the market. How do you, how do you help and how does OPEC think about managing in a, in, in a world of that much uncertainty? When you look, when you look at the framework, uh, of the Declaration of Cooperation, you will see that it is a very flexible mechanism. It is very, very adaptable uh, to changing circumstances. In the last three years, you could see at different times of the evolution of the market, we use the same mechanism in maintaining balance. And this mechanism, we can say, has so far been perfected. And hence the decision, for example, on December the 5th and 6th to adjust with another 500,000 and to convene a meeting in early March to reassess uh, the outlook for 2020, which would have been much more clearer than probably when we took the decision on the December 5th uh, and 6th. So the difference today is that we have this framework uh, which has been tested and proven it has worked, and we have continue, continuously going to apply this mechanism uh, in 2020 and beyond. I'm wondering if you could respond to what I said in the, in the prior panel. I, I made a comment about the new dynamic with shale in the market and how short cycle it is, how responsive it is, and how markets respond, and producers hedge, and, and the back of the curve doesn't move. So how does the new, is shale a fundamental new dynamic that changes the way OPEC thinks about what it can do to manage markets? Well, the shell producers have become uh, very, very important players uh, in the industry and in the market. And uh, as you would know, we had open discussions for the first time with the shell producers in the US. Uh, I look forward to our next session at the next Sera week in Houston, where we meet with all, uh, or if not most of the uh, uh, independence in the shell basins to exchange views, to compare notes, uh, to compare our outlooks. I think in the last two, three years that we initiated this dialogue with them, uh, we came to realize that uh, uh, we needed to do this much, much earlier uh, than now, and that we now better understand ourselves. And uh, to their credit, uh, they requested us to continue uh, with this uh, with this dialogue, mm -hmm. uh, and and hence now there's a free flow of data, uh, for example, uh, of analysis between our good selves, and we are institutionalizing this uh, annual meeting uh, with the with, with with the shell producers. So in our, in our final minutes, let me ask you about some of what we were talking about this morning by way of the energy transition. OPEC's most recent world oil outlook uh, issued last fall looked ahead to a peaking of oil demand in little more than a decade. How, how does the notion of an impending slowdown in oil demand growth, possible peaking of oil demand growth, in affect the interaction between and among OPEC members? In our 2019 outlook, 
we do not see oil and gas uh, being challenged by alternative energy sources. What we see is a continuous growth, not only of energy to the tune of 25% uh, to 2040, but also in terms of uh, demand growth for oil and gas. Uh, by 2040, uh, we continue to see these two sources of energy accounting for more than 50% uh, of the energy basket. You've heard from Total and ExxonMobil uh, this morning, 90% of our energy today is accounted for by the so-called uh, fossil fuels. Uh, for us, uh, these are beautiful uh, sources of energy that are responsible for the growth, uh, the development, and the prosperity of uh, uh, this generation. Uh, the current civilization that we see today is a civilization that is fueled by these fuels. And in our outlook to 2040, uh, the world will continue to consume. Uh, as uh, uh, Patrick Wien of Total eloquently explained, uh, it is demand driven because the world will continue to yearn for more energy. There is a growing thirst because of population growth. In our outlook that you quoted, we see additional 1.6 billion people coming into this world between now and 2040. We see the global economy doubling in size by 2040. We see the developing countries uh, emerging strongly uh, in terms of uh, development. Uh, so the combination of all these factors uh, will require us in the industry to invest heavily in a predictable manner uh, to meet this growing demand, but in the most efficient manner uh, that will also take into account the environmental credentials of these uh, beautiful sources of energy. And, and, and at the same time, as we talked about on the panel this morning, also seeing growing social pressure for faster shift toward lower carbon forms of energy and for companies mm -hmm. and producer countries to move more quickly in that direction. What does that mean for OPEC members? We have been in the forefront with the rest of the industry, including Saudi Aramco and others, in uh, advocating for an all-inclusive dialogue. Uh, the current narrative, uh, in our opinion, as we have heard in your panel this morning, uh, is defective in so many ways. Uh, this transition is not from point A to point B. Uh, it is not from one source of energy to another source of energy. It has to be all-inclusive, it has to be comprehensive, where all the sources of energy will be required. The numbers that you had been quoted by the chairman of Aramco uh, in his opening remarks of one billion people who have no access to electricity, uh, three billion people who have no access to clean cooking fuels. And I'm just coming from Abu Dhabi, uh, where it was also rolled out that three billion people have no access to the internet. Now, what's going to happen to them? Now, is this transition a divide between those who have and those who have not? Uh, so I think policymakers, both at national levels, at uh, corporate uh, levels, and the larger civil society need to come together to dispassionately uh, review the current narrative. Uh, the situation where companies now are facing severe headwinds in accessing funding uh, for projects in this industry, in our opinion, is alarming. Uh, I, I wish we had much more time to continue this conversation. There's mo so much more to talk about, but hopefully we'll be, have another opportunity to do that uh, soon. Uh, I'm glad you're feeling better. Wish you the best of health. And you have a challenging job in front of you in 2020. We wish you much luck and success. Please join me in thanking His Excellency Secretary General Barkindo. Distinguished guests, 
Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure to start the CEO plenary session. Themed, Vision to Prosperity, a new energy era emerges. Please join me in welcoming on stage some of the, our industry top leaders